There's the Countess of Ross. Mm. And, um, that's John Jacob Astor, the richest man on the ship. Uh huh. His little wifey there, Madeline, is my age and in a delicate condition. We, we know, Rose. See how she's trying to hide it? Quite the scandal. You already told us that. And that's Benjamin Guggenheim and his mistress, Madame Aubert. Oh. Mrs. Guggenheim is at home with the children, of course. Okay. Well, let's talk about it. In the immediate days after the Titanic sank, there was a frenzy amongst the relatives of its passengers to get information on their loved ones, hoping that the ones they knew beat the odds and were among the survivors. Incorrect headlines had been printed, reflecting that people who had in fact died were alive. People like John Jacob Astor and Isidore and Ida Strauss. There was even uncertainty about who had even boarded the ship to begin with, as can be seen in this notice that was printed in the Buffalo News on April 16, 1912, that shows that Benjamin Guggenheim's brother had some questions of his own. Quote, Senator Guggenheim of Colorado, in telephone consultation with the White Star Line officials in New York today, was unable to learn of the fate of his brother, Benjamin Guggenheim, reputed one of the wealthiest men in the world. So far as known, his wife did not accompany him. Well, his wife certainly did not accompany him. That might have made the trip rather odd for his mistress. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these stories about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Miss history a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream. And hit that like button to support this video. Thank you. Now, on to why you are here. For a lot of us, when we hear the name Guggenheim, the first thing that comes to mind is the Guggenheim. Maybe we don't think of its full name, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum. But today's subject, Benjamin Guggenheim, is part of that Guggenheim family. Like a number of the men who traveled in first class on the RMS Titanic in April of 1912, he was one of the wealthiest in the world. He, like his brothers, made his fortune on the coattails and name of his father, Mayor Guggenheim. He started out in the importing business in the 1840s and eventually made his huge fortune in the mining and smelting industries, leaving generational wealth for his 10 children who he had with his wife, Barbara seven boys and three girls. Most of his sons went into the family business. The Guggenheim is the namesake of one of those sons, Solomon. Benjamin Guggenheim was an industry captain of mining and smelting and helped to expand the family business into Europe. He married his wife in 1894. They had three daughters together. Yet he had a reputation for being a playboy around New York City. Now, I have long heard this narrative that Benjamin Guggenheim went down on the Titanic in true Playboy fashion, dressed in his best, saying that he was prepared to go down like a gentleman. But I never really understood exactly why people said that about him, that he had a reputation for being a Playboy. Yes, he was traveling on the Titanic with his French mistress, but that could have been a very unlucky and isolated incident. But after searching through five years worth of newspapers, I finally saw that it wasn't an isolated incident, and that Benjamin Guggenheim had a cheating scandal that made it to the papers in 1907. It is very evident from newspaper articles and stories that Benjamin Guggenheim and his wife lived very separate lives. He was always in Europe for weeks and even months at a time. In fact, most of the times he was written about it was regarding his departure from or returning to America, and his wife often attended parties solo or through her own parties without him present. Benjamin Guggenheim being caught out on sea with a mistress was likely a big surprise to no one, because five years before the Titanic sank, he was named as a co-respondent in a divorce suit that another man, Samuel Tuska, brought against his wife, Amy Goldsmith Tuska, when he caught her in the act, in his apartment, with Benjamin Guggenheim. While most headlines about the Guggenheim-Tuska affair put it as gently as they could, the Morning Post on April 30, 1907, 
took another approach and spelled it out quite clearly in the biggest font offered at the time. Their headline read, Rich Man in Her Bedroom, Brother of United States Senator Guggenheim Implicated in a Divorce Suit, Husband Broke in Door to Get Evidence. Well, so here's what the story says. Of course, when you're from a family as rich and powerful and famous as the Guggenheims, when you have a tiny little slip up and happen to find yourself in the bed of a woman who is someone else's wife, the media is going to pull your whole family into the situation. So this article actually starts off talking about Benjamin Guggenheim's brother, Senator Simon Guggenheim, as if the readers would have confused Benjamin with some other guy named Benjamin Guggenheim. Anyway, it's the husband who filed for divorce, a man named Samuel Tuska. He was also a rich businessman. Not Guggenheim rich, but he held the positions of treasurer, director, and president of multiple companies, rich enough to move in the same circles as the Guggenheims. His wife was Amy Goldsmith Tuska, and he had been granted an absolute divorce from her. The couple had a son, a six-year-old named Robert, and Samuel was awarded full custody of him. According to the terms of the decree, Mrs. Tuska would have to apply at some later date for what we would now call visitation. But at the time the divorce was granted, she did not have the, quote, privilege of seeing the lad. And she lost another privilege in the divorce, one that she would not be able to regain at a later date. For, also according to the decree, she was not permitted to marry ever again. Well, that should have taught her to not mess over Samuel Tuska. All the parties involved, the Tuskas, the Goldsmiths, and especially Benjamin Guggenheim, did all that they could to keep this story private. And for good reason. Each of their families was a part of high society, and this story would be a bad look for each party in a different way. The Goldsmiths didn't want their daughter and sister to be seen as a trollop, I'm sure that Amy herself didn't want that either. Mr. Tuska certainly would not have wanted his own manhood called into question, but how could anyone think anything differently with another man coming into his home to serve as his wife? And the prominent and upright business leader, husband, and father, Benjamin Guggenheim, certainly didn't need for the world to know that he was an adulterer. Each family separately had enough money, power, and influence to keep the story concealed for some time. So the combined power of all three families kept the story out of the news until the court was finished with the case. And even then, the judge ordered that the papers in the case were to be sealed. Even though all of the murky details never made it to the press, it was made very clear that the nail in the coffin of the Tuska marriage was Benjamin Guggenheim being caught not only inside of Amy Tuska's bedroom, but inside of Amy Tuska. Quote, it was learned, however, that the divorce had been obtained on testimony that showed that Benjamin Guggenheim had been surprised under embarrassing circumstances in the apartment of Mrs. Tuska, end quote. And even though the Morning Post headline implies that it was Amy's husband who found her in bed with Benjamin, it's made clear from multiple reports that there were in fact two men hired by Samuel Tuska who broke into the apartment to catch the two in the throes of passion. Samuel must have had his suspicions. Every bit of the story is written in a flashback style because no one outside of the involved parties knew anything. So, right after the affair was discovered, the Tuskas separated. They had lived separately for over a year leading up to the trial, and only a handful of their closest friends even knew that. And the ones who knew that they were separated didn't know why. Nobody had a clue that Benjamin Guggenheim had been sleeping with Amy. And just like that, Amy lost her husband, her son, and her close friend, Florette. Who was Florette? I'm glad you asked. Florette Seligman. Florette Seligman, Guggenheim. Benjamin's wife. Yeah, she was sleeping with her close friend's husband. So you can imagine that it was a shock to everyone who saw the story in the papers, because by that time, everything was settled. 
Had this story played out in the public eye in real time, there would have been hundreds, maybe even thousands, of news articles about it. But Samuel Tuska moved in silence. As soon as the word got back to him that Benjamin was having sex with his wife, he hired a divorce attorney, a family member named Benjamin also, Benjamin Tuska. And they got the ball rolling on the divorce immediately. After Amy was served divorce papers, she hired an attorney and denied the claims. But since she was caught getting Guggenheimed, nobody believed her, and the divorce went through per her husband's wishes. Even though she claimed her innocence and didn't want the divorce, she went out as gracefully as she could have, considering the circumstances. She didn't ask for alimony, which is good because Samuel certainly wasn't going to give her any. But it's not like she lived out the remainder of her life in poverty. She came from a wealthy family, too, and was an heiress in her own right, thanks to her father's fortune. Benjamin Guggenheim sent in a written denial to the court via his attorney. His friends were surprised and upset with him because they thought that if the allegations weren't true, then he should have gone further to protect his own image and Amy's also. They thought that if he really wanted to set the record straight, he would have gone before the court to give oral testimony. Perhaps he was too tired from already having given oral... Never mind. The judge, who was called a referee in this ruling, could only disclose to the media that the testimony of the two men who walked in on Benjamin and Amy was, quote, sensational in character. Now, at the time the news broke, all of the involved parties knew that the year-old story was finally going to become public. So... Most likely in an effort to ride out the storm with as little embarrassment as possible, Amy Goldsmith Tuska went away to Paris in early April of 1907, three weeks prior to the public announcement. Guess who else was in Paris when the story broke? Benjamin Guggenheim. But don't worry, he probably wasn't stuffing his sausage into Amy's croissant. He took his wife and kids with him. And oh yeah... His wife had no idea about any part of this story. I guess that Benjamin thought that his wife might take the news better while taking a stroll down the Champs-Élysées. Remember, this story broke on the last day of April. Guggenheim's lawyer told the papers that Benjamin wasn't feeling well, but would be back to visit New York City for business in June. No doubt, bringing his whole family back with him from Paris. Then after that, according to Attorney Leavenworth, because Benjamin had not been feeling well for the last eight months, perhaps his stomach was feeling a little queasy from his worries about this story breaking, but anyway, because Benjamin had not been feeling well for the last eight months, he would live abroad for most of the time the next year. That is almost a verbatim quote from his attorney. Reading between the lines, it sounds like Benji Boy was leaving his wife at home to deal with the shame of his affair that became public while he went back to Europe and did whatever he wanted to do. Or whomever he wanted to do. And with that said, I think that we now know one of the reasons why Benjamin Guggenheim had a reputation for being a playboy. He earned it fairly and on his last transatlantic trip on the Titanic in April of 1912, Benjamin was returning home to his wife and children with his Parisian mistress on board with him. But we'll get into their story in part two, where I will also give my sources for this story. In the meantime, Benjamin Guggenheim wasn't the only millionaire having some fun with a much younger woman on the Titanic. So was the richest man on the ship, John Jacob Astor, but at least the teenager he was having fun with was his wife. I published a video about their Titanic story that you can see here. I will leave a link to it in the description box. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ties Too Hot, Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. 
Come and join us there for the hot, hot mess history. The link is in the description box.